Rome, August 15th, 29 BCE. It's the third day of Octavian's triumph, celebrating his victory over Egypt and the East. He's been laying the groundwork for becoming Rome's first emperor and wants a party that feels like a coronation. So, he spares no expense on the triumph's displays. But the most costly addition comes last. Rome's greatest enemy, Cleopatra. Though robbed of a living prisoner by a snake's bite, Octavian has commissioned a life-size replica, depicting Cleopatra at the moment of her death. Onlookers are stunned. It's so realistic, most assume it's her real body. And it's this posthumous display that represents the moment that Cleopatra passed from living memory into history and myth. Because while Octavian's propaganda machine turned the Queen of the Nile into a useful foil for the rise of the Roman Empire, it also ensured Cleopatra would enjoy what the ancient pharaohs only dreamed of when they built the pyramids. Eternal life. Even if you enjoy a level of notoriety in your life, there's no guarantee that your story will live on past your death. Even incredibly famous world leaders and celebrities can be forgotten within the span of a few decades, sometimes even a few years. But that's what makes Cleopatra's story so remarkable. She was a charismatic world leader, sure, but that doesn't explain why she's been remembered not just by historians, but also by average people on the street two millennia after her death. In fact, the list of people from that long ago who were remembered in this way is super short. For the Western world, it's Alexander the Great, Cleopatra, of course, and the JCs, Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ. Then maybe, of course, his mom, Mary of Nazareth. And if I could just perpetuate one of my own biases, maybe slide David Bowie in there somewhere. But that's pretty much it. The VIP section is closed, folks. Better luck next millennia, everyone. So how did Cleopatra join that illustrious group? Well, remember what I said way back in episode one about Alexander the Great? One of the reasons we remember him is because he had Ptolemy recording his deeds. And the story's similar for both the JCs. Caesar wrote books about himself, and Jesus Christ had the New Testament. Now, while Cleopatra didn't have her own publicist, and she didn't do much writing of her own that we know of, she did have someone else obsessed with recording her life, Octavian. In addition to the display at his triumph, Octavian made sure that Cleopatra's memory lived on through the art, literature, and history produced during his reign as Emperor Augustus. The most important example of this work is in Virgil's Aeneid, an epic poem commissioned by Augustus to serve as a binding foundational myth for Rome, as well as a promotional tool for the emperor and his new family. Now, Augustus isn't in the poem per se, but he's clearly represented by the poem's protagonist, Aeneas. In fact, you know what? Let's see if we can all get the very, very subtle subtext. Aeneas is handsome, savvy, and guided by traditional Roman values. And at a pivotal moment in the Aeneid, Aeneas meets and falls in love with Queen Dido of Carthage. Dido is charismatic and clever, and has fled her homeland of Phoenicia for fear of being murdered by her brother. Though their love is intense and passionate, the pious Aeneas submits to the will of the gods and leaves Dido for Italy to establish Rome. Then, crestfallen, Dido commits suicide in dramatic fashion. Yeah, okay, I'm going to take some wild stabs in the dark here and say that Aeneas guy is actually Augustus and Dido is, oh, let me think, I'm feeling like a little bit of wish fulfillment about his relationship with Cleopatra. Did we just find the hidden meaning? Jokes aside, it isn't subtle. And the meaning would have been crystal clear to any Roman of this time period. Augustus succeeded because he didn't fall for the same trap as Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. He remained true to Roman values and avoided temptations of foreign women from the East. Plus, the more ingenious and formidable he depicts his version of Cleopatra, the better he looks for beating her. It was really a brilliant way to put himself in the center of the story. And not just by besting the wily Cleopatra, but also succeeding where the great Caesar and Antony had failed. Thanks to Augustus, Cleopatra became foundational to Roman self-image during the new imperial age. Because when you're trying to create an identity for your people, it's important that you develop an antagonist. Someone or something you can overcome to show your ability, but also to highlight the characteristics and habits that you oppose. More often than not, groups define who they are by defining what they aren't through singling out some other group they consider to be their opposite. Historians call this process othering and refer to its target as the other. Thanks to Augustus and his propaganda, Cleopatra became, for better or worse, the great other of the Roman world. 
the enemy that had to be overcome, the decadent and immoral woman that Rome was most certainly not. So given that, it's not surprising that the memory of Cleopatra lived on through the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. But how do we explain the popularity of Cleopatra today? Well, Globe Theatre, London, 1607 CE. It's scene two, act five of William Shakespeare's new play, Antony and Cleopatra. The theater's packed, with many audience members standing on the dirt floor, looking on as the members of the King's Men acting company step forward. A young man portraying Cleopatra puts a snake to his breast and says her final line. As sweet as balm, as soft as air, as gentle. Oh, Antony. Nay, I will take thee too. <sighs> what should I stay? She falls to the floor, dead, and the audience weeps. Commoners, shedding tears for a queen who died a millennium and a half before their births from a land they can't even imagine. Because Cleopatra's story of war, love, tragedy, and death is powerful, resonating beyond its original time and place. And that resonance is the secret ingredient to Cleopatra's longevity in our historical memory. To be sure, a lot of our knowledge of Cleopatra is based on the popularity of classic Roman histories and the leftover busts, coins, statues, and memorials from her reign. But that only gets you so far. To be remembered for centuries, truly remembered, you need a compelling story. A story people can't stop thinking about, reliving, and retelling. In the classical era, her stories were the basis for propaganda and epic poems. In the Middle Ages, she inspired romantic poetry and some of Chaucer's tales of courtly love. Then during the Renaissance, she was a major figure in breathtaking art and became the leading lady for one of Shakespeare's most famous plays. In the Industrial Age, she was the protagonist of George Bernard Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra, a play designed to critique modern politics. And finally, in our own age, Cleopatra and her stories are material for dozens of movies, television shows, and even video games with assassins and microtransactions. Cleopatra didn't need to build a pyramid, for her monuments are all around us. Even though these fictionalized portrayals often play fast and loose with history, they nevertheless help sustain the memory of an important historical figure. And when it comes to historical memory, historical fiction is often as important, if not more so, than scholarly history. Because, I mean, think about it. Would an everyday person know as much as they do now about the $10 founding father without a father if it weren't for, what's your name, man? Truly accurate or not, these stories have power. But almost all of these portrayals of Cleopatra do have one thing in common. They were written by men. From Virgil to the many Hollywood producers of today, Cleopatra's narrative has been dominated by men, who tend to depict her like Octavian's ancient propaganda an object of sexual desire and temptation, rather than the astute political operator she actually was. So in crafting our extra history of Cleopatra, we wanted to base our research in the recent scholarly histories written by women, including Mary Beard, Cara Cooney, and Prudence Jones. That way, we could bring you the most up-to-date interpretation of The Last Pharaoh from women who knew way more about Cleopatra than we ever could. And our learning of the story of Cleopatra is still ongoing. Maybe it will stay the same, or maybe new archaeological findings will fundamentally shift our perspective or add new elements. But no matter what, her story will remain in our minds. After all, when Cleopatra made that drunken bet we talked about in the beginning of our first episode, she knew exactly what she was doing. The pearl would dissolve into nothing, sure. But the story of it, as well as the many other fantastic stories from Cleopatra's life, would live on for all time. Bottoms up, everyone. Legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One for helping to make this show possible. 